Osseberg. The Osseberg style is the first noted style in traditional Viking art. Its name derives from the burial mound discovered at Osseberg, Norway, in 1904-1905. At this burial place, the famous Osseberg Viking longship made of oak wood was uncovered, and has remained one of the most studied works of this period. The Osseberg style was popular throughout mainland Scandinavia. Some of the most remarkable wood carving from the Viking Age was created in this style. The animal motifs were a continuation of artistic traditions from previous periods, as I mentioned in part one of this series, from before the Viking Age. They included birds, human faces sometimes thought to be masks, such as we see on the Osseberg burial cart. Two animal motifs were especially popular and widespread, the ribbon animal and the gripping beast, and both of these are visible on the stern of the Osseberg longship. The ribbon animal was typically pictured as a highly abstracted creature with an elongated body and simplified features, appearing individually and in pairs, sort of like a long snake that keeps curving and curling around endlessly. In contrast, the gripping beast, which is a fantastical creature that has clearly defined limbs, was usually anchored to the borders of designs and surrounding creatures. This motif was a novelty in the 9th century, and its compact shape contrasted with the ribbon animals. You can recognize it by its round head, wide eyes, its snub nose, its exaggerated biceps and thighs, and its omnipresent gripping legs. The gripping beast must have echoed something in the culture of Viking art, as it stood fast for a good 150 years. In Osseberg art, the animal motifs are very short and stocky, almost equal in size, with rounded eyes and tendril-like limbs, and these schematic figures are situated within fields that divide surfaces into clear segments and emphasize the balance and organization of images. The ship itself was an elegant fjord cruiser, too low in the radius for long voyages, and was made for funerary purposes for two women, an elite woman and her maidservant buried with her, whose skeletal remains were excavated in the burial site. It also included various objects or grave goods accompanying the burial. These ranged from decoratively carved wooden bedposts, sleighs or sleds, a wagon made from oak, wooden chests, a loom, and various other paraphernalia like wooden buckets with ladles and apples inside, as well as textiles and garments. The wooden buckets were made from yew wood, surrounded with decorative brass fittings, then held together with iron hoops. But one bucket stood out from the rest, referred to as the Buddha bucket, because each end of the brass handle is attached to the back of the head of two Buddha-like figures, sitting in what is seemingly a lotus posture. These metal figures are used as decorative and protective metal covers around various functional objects, like handles, doorknobs, keyholes, or in this case the bucket's handles. The torsos of the two figures appear as ornamental squares, decorated in enamel, known as cloisonné enamel. What is unique about the Buddha-like figures is how close their resemblance is to Asian culture, and it's a debate whether they were influenced by it, especially Buddhist culture. Some scholars argue that the bucket was made in Ireland, and that the Buddha derives from Celtic and early Christian influences, that they are representations of the god Kernunos from Celtic mythology, who is often depicted as sitting in a lotus-like posture. There were artistic personalities, same as anywhere, and two notable sculptors have been recognized, otherwise also referred to as carvers because of how important wood carving was as a primary skill. These were named the Academician and the Baroque Master. Both of these artists carved animal headposts, which have been compared in stylistic differences. The Academician is described as having a traditional Viking art style, and the Baroque Master is described as more innovative in his style. The first is a masterpiece of constraint. The head is covered with a flat, well-spaced mesh of intertwined birds. His neck is completely smooth with a geometric ornament at the bottom. A comparable post made by the Baroque master is entirely covered with striking beasts, sculpted with a good sense of plasticity. Metal pieces of the same stage of development as the Osseberg objects are represented by objects found in Broa, in Gotland, Sweden. They are mainly gilt bronze bridal mounts, a bridal bit, a sword hilt, etc. Most of the animal motifs found on them can be paralleled on the Osseberg objects, 
So sometimes for this reason the style is called the Broa style. In Gotland, there is a whole series of stones in relief with scenes of legends randomly placed over most of the surface. The most commonly depicted motif is a magnificent ship, closely resembling the Oseberg ship, with a biral bow and stern, a large square sail, and a company of warriors armed for battle. The discovery at Oseberg also included some tapestries, which despite their poor condition, are believed to depict battle scenes and a religious procession. They illustrate many objects found in the grave, indicating that material goods were important for performing customs and rituals in life and in death. The boar style was also popular on the mainland, and was named for a set of bronze bridal mounds from a ship burial at Boar, Norway. The boar overlaps with the Oseberg and the Elling styles, periods specific to the Viking Age. However, unlike the Oseberg style, boar artistic conventions spread to the British Isles and to the Baltic regions, as the Vikings traveled both east and west. Exchanges between local and foreign artistic customs can be seen on objects found in these areas. The gripping beast still remains a major part of the style, but the sinuousness gave way to a more triangular head a cat-like face with round eyes and protruding ears. Boar objects swarm the viewer with decor. Forms are arranged in closed compositions with tight knot-like interlacing that almost fully obscures the background. This style appears to be truly Norse with very little outside influences and has appeared in Iceland, Russia, and England, which shows the fact that Viking art existed wherever they went. In Great Britain, stone crosses can be seen in this style, and there is one example of this on the Isle of Man. The characteristic elements of the boar style, such as a triangular head, a cat-like face with round eyes and protruding ears, are clearly evident in an example from Gotland in Sweden, the silver disc brooch. This brooch has several human and animal-like figures arranged in a circular pattern, some protruding more than others. There are four four-legged animals and four human figures, each arranged in between the other. The animals appear as if their heads are bending all the way to their back with their tongues licking their backs. The human figures appear squatted, holding a V-shaped object around their neck area. In an aerial view of this object, we notice the human figures appear to be looking upwards as we notice their full oval or triangular shaped faces with rounded eyes and large noses. Other objects from this style include the gold spur with the ring chain pattern, a pattern characteristic of this style. The ring chain pattern is also called ring braid and appears as various intertwining and interlacing circles. The gout ring chain, an island variant of the boar type, is also found on a wooden game board in Ballanderry, Ireland. The boar style can be roughly dated from the treasure coins which include boar type jewel treasures buried around 860. The Yelling style appears from the start of the 10th century and continues for about 75 years. The style is named after a silver cup from a royal burial mound in the town called Yelling in Denmark. The silver cup depicts the characteristic S-shaped animal with a head and large round eyes. The animal creatures surround the whole outside circumference of the cup, interlacing with one another to form a fluid patterned effect. We will also notice their serpentine bodies curling around the cup have dots in the center or metal-like beading. When we look at their heads, they appear to have large lips curling upwards with a long ponytail interweaving behind their bodies to create a pattern. Thus the background becomes more pronounced. Furthermore, these long ribbon animals also appear to have legs or arms with a paw or hoof as their appendages, similar to the gripping beast motif. Some sources indicate these appear like mitts. The hip joints are represented as spirals, like that of the boar style. However, unlike the boar style, the anatomy of animal and human figures is simpler, with bodies portrayed as solid masses defined by individual or double contour lines. In the yelling style, stylistic animals are S-shaped and intertwined with heads in profile, spiral hips, and pigtails. Boar and yelling overlap, and occasionally both are used on the same object. For example, a brooch from Odishog, Ostergotland, has boar intertwined in its center and typical yelling animals on its sides. 
In England, the yelling style is found in a strangely modified form on a series of Yorkshire crosses. On these, the delicate ribbon interlacing is rendered in a thick paste-like form, probably by an Anglo-Saxon who did not fully understand the style. This is a quote from J.R. Green's A Short History of the English People, from 1902. Found in the huge double barrow in which the heathen king Gorm the Old, founder of the Danish monarchy, from 900 to 936, and his Christian wife Thera, were buried side by side at Yelling in Jutland. The cup is of silver gilt inside and ornamented with an old half mythological pattern of twisted snakes and fantastic animals. Mammon The main motif of the Mammon style seems to be imposing beasts in a heraldic position, which we've seen show up before in previous styles and in this style takes center stage. The Mammon style overlaps in both time and appearance with the yelling and emerged from it, but shows a more emphatic form on the same theme. The animals have larger bodies than ribbons, spirals at the hips. The new line is made of plant-like tendrils, ultimately derived from the Carolingian acanthus. A few of the qualities associated with the yelling style are exaggerated in it, like geometric shapes that segment the wrists, ankles, and other body parts of animals. The Mammon style was given the name from an axe head, discovered in a grave in Mammon, a village in Denmark, and it is known to be the most luxurious Viking axe ever found. It has very striking inlaid designs done in silver, which also suggests that the axe was used for ceremonial purposes and not functional purposes. The decorations on the axe head are on both sides. One side is mainly filled with interlacing foliate patterns. The other side shows what looks to be a giant bird-like figure with similar tentacle-like formations intertwining with it. Again, we see the large spiral shape at the hip joint with a stylized head and round eyes. This composition also allows more background space, similar to the yelling style which came before it. One of the primary characteristics of this style is seen on the large-scale rune stones called the yelling stones, which were discovered in Yelling Town. These stones have become the cornerstones of the Mammon style due to the significant motif referred to as the Great Beast. It can be dated by an inscription to 983 AD. On the one side of the stone, we notice a large animal or hybrid of an animal due to its many different features of different animals. For example, its head is adorned with a set of what appears to be antlers and two small pointed horns. Along the neck, we notice a mane of hair as we find on a horse's neck. The feet, and what we assume are hooves, appear as claws. The tail of the hybrid creature curls upwards into an elaborate display of quasi-emblematic curls. We also notice a serpent-like figure around the body, neck, and tail of the creature. The major mobility areas are depicted with the characteristic spiral shape. Lastly, the figure's head appears triangular, with a triangle as a snout and a circle as an eye and its mouth seems to be open with a large curling L-shape coming from it. The Great Beast is often referred to as representing power, which is understandable when placed within the context of how these yelling stones came to be. The yelling stone was erected by King Harold Bluetooth in honor of his parents when they died. It was also erected to honor and celebrate his victory of being King of Norway and Denmark. Furthermore, King Bluetooth also introduced Christianity in Denmark, with an increased number of people converted. The king himself was a devout Christian. This also explains the other side of the yelling stone, which depicts the crucified figure of Christ. The inscriptions on the stone give further evidence of the conversion from paganism to Christianity, and this makes the yelling stone one of the most interesting examples of Viking art. Not only does it incorporate all the typical features of Viking art, like intricate knotwork and stylized depictions of animals and men, but it also shows the religious syncretism and the Vikings' subjective interpretation of their new religion. This is not a normal image of the crucifixion, because there's one fundamental element missing, the crucifix itself. Instead of the cross, the figure of Christ is held down by the ribbon-like bands themselves. Two famous caskets were made in the Mammon style, called Bamberg and Kamen caskets. The Bamberg casket is in the National Museum in Munich, 
Sadly, during World War II, the Kamen casket was reported as destroyed during fires in the Cathedral of St. John, located in Kamen, where it was housed, but photos survive. Both are stocky caskets with sloping, roof-like lids made of thin panels of ivory and horn connected by bronze bands. The panels are completely filled in with animals and tendrils, while the metal bands are more simply decorated with raised animal heads. Ringerike The Ringerike style is named after the Ringerike district in Norway. This is also the location where more runestones were erected due to their increase in popularity, and because of the increasing Christianization, burial objects were no longer put in the graves, and our knowledge of their art depended more on the decoration of these tomb slabs, which illustrate the adaptation of a pagan art to Christian use. The Ringerike style flourished particularly well in England during the reign of King Knut from 1016 to 1035 because there were many Viking patrons in England and because the style was easily assimilated by artists familiar with and working in the contemporary Winchester School, a manuscript style created in England which also extended to works in metal and ivory. The Ringerike style further developed an element of the Mammon style, which is that the growing tendrils now threaten to dominate the animals that they usually surround. In the manuscripts, the subtle change from Winchester Acanthus to Ringerike can be observed by comparing two manuscripts. In the first one, the Acanthus ornament is lush but controlled. In the latter, it is thinner and pushing, always surpassing its limits. In England, the style lost popularity in the 1050s, shortly before the Norman conquest, but it continued in Ireland until the 1120s, where it was very influential and can be seen in many creations. Lion-shaped beasts still appear as well as plant motifs and foliate patterns. Ringerike animals are exceedingly curvy and thin, with almond-shaped eyes and thinner, longer tendrils, and the lines exist without the dots or decorative beads in between. An example of the above is in the carved stone at St. Paul's Churchyard, located in London. Here we see a beast-like animal appearing horse-like, seemingly in a constricted state, overwhelmed by various other figures attached to it. Its head and neck are reared facing behind it with what seems to be its tongue flicking out of its mouth, curling at the end tip. There is more dynamism in this stone carving due to all the figures filling up the composition. We also notice other animal-like figures near the bottom holding onto the beast's legs. Also, we notice the characteristic tendrils with hook-like ends. The major joints and mobility areas on the great beast are depicted as spirals. Another example in this style is the Vang stone, located in Vang, of the Valdis region in Norway. It is a large rune stone with red patterns covering most of the surface. Again, we notice the familiar tendril-like sinuous patterns with almost hook-like ends intertwining, reminiscent of the Norse knotwork so characteristic of the Viking culture. The top section of the stone's composition includes the lion-like animal in its heraldic stance with its mouth wide open as if it's roaring. The Urnus style is considered the last phase of Viking art and dates from 1050 to the 12th century. It was created in the time when the glory of the Vikings was fading during the transition phase of religion in the Viking community. Overall, Though it was influenced by the new religion, the Ernest style was still a modification of the previous Viking styles. It gets its name from a stave church in Ernest, Norway. As they adopted Christianity, Viking churches began to be built, and this is one of those. But there are also many objects of this style that have been found in Upland in Sweden. Carved wooden panels reveal sinuous animals interlacing and looping with long eyes pointed forward and upwardly curled appendages on their noses and necks. Snakes and plants are also featured. The greyhound-like creature appears to be fighting with a serpent. It commonly presented the figure eight and multitudes of loops in the main patterns. Like the previous Viking art, the earnest style showed the great beast, which was sort of a greyhound-like creature, and snakes made to look like thinner tendrils, Ribbons adding additional stylistic detail. Both the animals and the snake bit each other, creating the loops and the figure eight. The spiral hips appeared in the Ernest style, but not as much as it did in earlier styles like the Mammon style. 
The animal also had a larger eye, and it looked similar to a water drop. The snake's mouth is around the beast's neck, and simultaneously the beast's mouth is around the snake's neck. What is different about these styles is that the designs are more refined and sleeker in appearance, a more delicate essence of spirals and curves. We also see a finer delineation of curves, and the characteristic spiral that accentuates the hip areas of the four-legged animal is smaller. The four-legged animal also has smaller feet compared to the previous styles where it had grabbing, often intimidating, claw-like feet. This style also occurred in countries like England and Ireland. A popular example is the Pitney brooch which was found in Somerset, England in a churchyard during the 1870s. It is made from gold and copper alloy and portrays the serpentine figure intertwined with a thinner ribbon-like animal. The snake is biting its own body. The brooch also appears asymmetrical in design, which is another feature characteristic of this Viking design style. Besides the stave church, archaeologists have also found an artifact of the earnest style in this runestone. Some scholars believe that the dragon is protecting the stone and the runic inscription, and that the snake is the leash of the dragon to keep it tethered. However, this art was doomed to extinction because of the introduction of stone building in Scandinavia, and with it architectural sculpture and painting of Mediterranean inspiration put an end to the earnest style. It was used sporadically during the 12th century in Scandinavia and in Britain, and had its last echoes for centuries in Scandinavian folk art. During the earnest period, there was an increase in the spread of Christianity across Scandinavia, and the Viking culture and influence started to decline. Prior to the 10th century, Scandinavian regions were considered peripheral to Western Europe, but they finally became integrated into Christianity and European-style monarchy. The Ringerica and Urn styles flourished through this time until the European Romanesque style was popularized, which totally displaced pagan traditions and brought about a true original medieval style, which ended the strange interlude that lasted during the whole early Middle Ages between barbarian artistic styles and revivals of classical art, mixed together in a curious and not totally integrated way. Christianity became the dominant religion in the Romanesque period, which was focused on building more churches, sculptures, and icons for the religious education of the masses.